Hey there, and welcome back to another Obi-Wan Kenobi review. And today we're going to be talking about the final episode of the series, Part 6, which follows up from the cliffhanger ending of the refugee ship fleeing from Darth Vader, and Reva discovering that Luke Skywalker is on Tatooine. And before we go any further than that, I know this series has gotten a fair bit of criticism, some warranted and some unwarranted in my opinion, but despite all of that, this episode, at least in my opinion, is borderline perfect. Just an all-around great episode, which wrapped up a lot of storylines in satisfying ways, had one of the best battles of all time, and set itself up nicely to bridge the gap between episodes 3 and 4. I mean, the only real problem I had with it was, to me at least, the travel times were weird as hell. Well, maybe I had a few more minor complaints that I'm sure I'll pick up on during the rewatch I'm about to do, but for the most part, everything worked well on my first look, and I doubt that's going to be changing. But with all that being said, let's jump into the episode. So, we start off the episode back in Mos Esper, I think it is. That's the town, right? I don't know. It's one of the main ones, where we see people lining up to get their water rations. <sighs> Living on this planet would suck. Imagine living on a world where your only source of water is farmers who have to put machines deep into the ground to extract moisture, and then you have to pay them. No wonder Anakin went insane. I mean, it would suck to live here as a free person, let alone being a slave. No wonder the poor kid had so many issues. Anyway, the asshole foreman guy that worked on the meat cutting site with Obi-Wan pushes some old dude out of the way to steal his water, and then Reva intervenes, and sadly, she does not kill this man. But she frightens him off, and then asks after Owen, and the location of his farm. And I'm guessing here that the water vendor, who likely enjoys being alive, tells her where he is. But seriously, how is she still alive? For one, has she sought medical treatment? How did she get off Jabim? Didn't Vader destroy the only other non-imperial ship? Did she crawl her way to town? I know the Grand Inquisitor said that vengeance does wonders for the will to live, but surely she would have needed some sort of help at the very least. Vader impaled her with a blade that melts metal. Come on. It is a bit hard to suspend my disbelief for this part. I mean, at least the Grand Inquisitor had a few episodes to rest before we saw him again. We then move on to the space battle, where their tiny little ship is somehow not escaping the giant cruiser. And I just don't understand how this has happened. Their ship left from Jabim, right? Vader was still in the hangar, and then he had to duel Reva, and that went for like, what, three, four minutes? Then he and the Grand Inquisitor stood by and roasted her a little bit, and then I assume he walked back to his ship, because you never see him run. And then he has to have his shuttle fly him back to his cruiser. And only then could they really begin the chase. Wouldn't they be a bit further away than this? And if the cruiser is capable of catching the ship on such a handicapped start, wouldn't they be right on top of them at this point? Be able to suck them in like they do to Tantive 4 at the start of A New Hope, and just storm the ship with troopers? Also, you see them get hit with lasers multiple times. Why don't they explode? I mean, the little fighters can blow each other up with one or two shots, and they're the same size as each other. So wouldn't a shot from a much larger ship with much larger guns just straight up blow them up? I mean, I get they have rear reflectors and stuff, but they say shit like that all the time in the films and they still get shot down. Look at the trench run from A New Hope. They all die. So yeah, I guess I'll have to suspend my disbelief a little bit for this section. Also, why didn't they send out TIE fighters from the ship? I'm so confused. On board the ship, Roken tries to reassure everybody that the ship is fine, and that the hyperdrive is going to be ready soon for their escape. But Obi-Wan deduces that this is in fact a lie, and that they're in all likelihood going to get shot down. Obi-Wan then walks through the refugees, and speaks to Leia, who's using Lola to take their minds off their imminent deaths. And seriously, this girl is the sweetest little kid. Anyway, Obi-Wan looks like he's going to do the old noble sacrifice thing again, and is psyching himself up for it. Before we cut back to Tatooine, where Owen and Luke arrive at a junk shop to buy a new belt for their speeder. And this is where the water salesman finds them, and tells Owen that somebody's looking for them. So yeah, this would be a pretty big shit your pants moment. And then we cut back to the ship, where Leia rages at Obi-Wan for even considering leaving her behind, and he has to convince everybody to actually let him leave. Because nobody wants to sacrifice him so they can escape, which is all well and good, but there are heaps of kids here. It feels like this plan, at least, is better than everybody dying. He then once again entrusts Leia's safety to Haja, of all people, instead of Roken for some reason, despite that guy being way more reliable and dependable, but whatever, Obi-Wan. Before we head back to Tatooine and see Owen and Luke turn up at the farm, where Owen tells Baru that somebody's coming after them to get to Luke, and that whilst Owen wants to run and hide, Baru straight up pulls some blasters out of the wall and plans to fight. Aunt Baru, the unexpected gunslinger, is not what I expected out of this episode, and I'm all here for it. And honestly, I think Owen was equally surprised, judging by the look of his face. But I also think that he was all there for this. He liked this side of his wife. And I really loved this whole scene. I feel like Star Wars 
kind of forgets that Luke had any parents other than Anakin. A New Hope kind of acts like he is their nephew and nothing more. But here, we see that he's their son in every way that counts, and that they're willing to fight anybody to keep him safe, and really makes their fate a whole lot sadder. And it also makes the fact that he never brings them up ever again equally sad. Seriously, they're underrated, and honestly, so are the Organas. Anakin is literally the shittest parent in canon, or at least, that I can remember. So he can just piss off. Luke Skywalker? Pfft, more like Luke Lars, boy. But back to the ship again, and we see Leia once more getting upset that Obi-Wan's essentially committing suicide by drawing Vader away from them. And so, to make it up to her, he gives her Tala's holster. No blaster though, after all, she's only 10 years old. So, did Tala just not put on her holster when she went into battle last time? Did she conveniently forget? I swear I saw her put it on. Or did it somehow survive the thermal detonator unscathed? It's a bit weird, but I get why they did it, and so I'm okay with it. He then makes an ill-advised promise to return and see her again, but I guess false comfort's better than no comfort at all, and after a failed attempt to contact Qui-Gon, he tells Roken to keep on fighting for as long as he can, as he's a good leader. So, I doubt that's the last we see of this character. He'll probably return in some form somehow, and then off he goes. And so meanwhile, on Vader's ship, instead of chasing the remaining insurgents or sending out fighters after them and securing a bunch of young Force sensitives, Vader decides to go all in on Kenobi instead, as he wants his vengeance and is blind to anything else at this point. And the Grand Inquisitor actually has the balls to call him out and tell him it's the wrong play. Dude was lucky not to be throttled at this point, surely. I doubt I'd have the courage to say any of that, but... I guess he probably doesn't realise how much Vader hates Kenobi. He probably doesn't know he's Skywalker. We then return to Tatooine, where Owen and Beru are hiding Luke, telling him the Tusken Raiders are coming, and that he needs to hide, and run if he hears someone coming for him. And man, his face was so sad here, and, well, he genuinely looks like he isn't sure if he's going to see his parents again. And honestly, it was just nice to see some Luke in this show. I mean, I like the focus on Leia more, because Luke gets the most focus in the original trilogy, but it is good to see him regardless. Anyway, though... Back to the space battle, again. And Obi-Wan makes his way onto a planet, moon, thing, whatever, and Vader orders his shuttle prepared so he can face him alone. And I like the look the Grand Inquisitor gave him. The, you sure, mate? He's escaped you a number of times and is the reason you're in the suit. It's almost a smirk, and I imagine he had a good giggle when Vader came back to the ship later on all beat up. In the privacy of his own quarters, of course. Nobody wants to get choked to death. On the moon, Obi-Wan prepares for the fight. Taking off his outer layers, deep breathing, noticing Leia slip Lola into his pocket to make him less afraid, and to give him a reason to see her again. And this whole thing, it was quite cute. But anyway, from here, there's going to be a lot of cuts back and forth between the two battles, and when watching it, it was a bit distracting. And so when I'm talking about it, I'm not going to be jumping back and forth. So I'm going to start with the Vader-Obi-Wan duel, and then Reaver attacks the farm. And so here we go. So, Vader arrives on the planet, and Obi-Wan is there waiting for him. And they have this standoff, and then it's on. And I won't embarrass myself giving a play-for-play play when I have next to no knowledge of fencing or anything like that, but the main takeaway is Obi-Wan is back in business. And this battle is very cool, very emotional, great music, great choreography. I love that it's dark, and it's only illuminated by the sabers. And I also enjoyed that Vader doesn't just take him seriously straight away. He fights one-handed. He takes it easy. He's seeing what he can do, seeing if he actually has a chance to put up a fight. And then you see that moment sort of click in his head, the, oh shit, he isn't as weak as I thought he'd be. And then he gets on the back foot and he starts going two-handed. And I really love those little details. Vader gets manhandled very briefly and suddenly goes, whoop, better try. Then, after a cut, Vader and Obi-Wan are fighting their way through the rocky spires, and then they both remember that they're space wizards who can move things with their minds, and Obi-Wan tries to topple a spire on top of Vader, who ends up just saying, Nah, and hits him with a great one-liner. Seriously, Vader has the best one-liners when he talks down to people. And then he just casually tosses the entire Spire away, launches a boulder at Obi-Wan, and beats him down a little, launches a rock at his legs to knock him down mid-fight, which was actually a really clever bit of choreography, before just collapsing all the rocks and Spires down on top of him. Now, since Vader is apparently stupid, he doesn't seem to remember that Obi-Wan is also a space wizard and is also not dead. Seriously, can't he sense him? So Vader walks off, Obi-Wan uses his love for Luke and Leia to blast out of the rocks and chases him down to resume the duel. This time with the determination to prove that Vader is still too obsessed with getting the victory and thus he is still a Padawan. And this makes the lines from episode 4 make more sense again. 
They have a goddamn good duel. Obi-Wan once again remembers he can use the Force and pushes him back into a spire and then bombards him with all the rocks. And Vader, monster that he is, just tanks them all and keeps fighting before we see Obi-Wan do something very clever that we haven't seen in the films before and actually target his life support system on the suit. Seriously, he just bludgeons it and then dominates him, tosses a rock, pushes him back and smashes the helmet. And honestly... I didn't expect Vader to get so ruthlessly dominated here, but I really liked it. I mean, in the end, you know that Vader kills him anyway, in a terrible fight, but in the end he does win. So I don't think it makes him look weak. And since Vader punks out so many people, both in the films and in the extended canon in the comics and games and all of that, this just makes Obi-Wan look skilled and strong. But more than that, it shows that even though he might not be as strong as Vader, he knows him so well and that despite his words of being a different person, on a fundamental level, Anakin and Vader are the same person with the same flaws. And here, we finally get to see Hayden Christensen as Vader with the voice and everything. <sighs> this scene! It's just perfect! A live-action version of the scene with Ahsoka in the Rebels animation, and I'm glad they adapted it here. That moment was too cool not to also have it in live-action. Obi-Wan sees Vader's face and calls him Anakin, and here is where we get the birth of Darth Vader murdered Anakin, as Vader tells him that Anakin's gone, and that he is what remains. Before Obi-Wan starts crying and begging forgiveness for failing him, with Vader replying that he's not Obi-Wan's failure, and that Obi-Wan didn't kill Anakin. Vader did. And at first, I kind of thought he was almost absolving Obi-Wan, until you see the sick grin on his face when he says that he did it, so it's more that he's claiming credit, mocking him, enjoying his pain. And so Obi-Wan declares that his friend's dead, and leaves victorious, with Vader screaming out after him with the microphone quality of a 12-year-old raging over voice chat. And this moment was just so cool. And I liked that what Vader said actually did ring true. His strength has returned, hence why he was able to defeat him. But the weakness remains. He let him live, he didn't kill him. Even after all this time, he lets him go. He lets him live. How many people are going to die because he let that happen? But yeah, everything about this scene was just pure awesome. From the red and blue lights reflecting off their faces, to the half Hayden, half James Earl Jones voice for Darth Vader, the facial expressions, Obi-Wan's crying, ah, perfection! Hell, even the fact that Vader lost sight of everything in his pursuit of victory, and thus Obi-Wan was able to rally for the victory, it just, it was just so good. Anyway though, he leaves the planet, and so let's rewind the clock back to Reaver attacking the Lars farm. Reaver turns up outside, looking worse for wear, and I mean, did she walk there? Jesus. Anyway, they hear the perimeter sensors go off, and they take up their positions as she enters the courtyard. She activates her lightsaber, and they start blasting, throwing flower pots and boxes. And you know what? For two Tatooine farmers, they do very well for themselves. She is a trained Darksider. They're at a huge disadvantage, but they use surprise and their superior knowledge of their home to ambush her over and over, and outsmart her a couple of times. Hell, Owen even tries to fight her with what? Is that a big metal pipe? And he utters my favourite line of the episode when Reva questions that he loves the boy like his own. And he replies, he is my own. Love this. We finally get a look through the ultra grumpy facade to see the loving father underneath. This isn't something we really get to see in A New Hope, so I really appreciated it. And Baru's also just a pure badass. Makes me sad what happens to them now. Although, if it makes you feel any better, just... Imagine in your head, Canon, that there's a bunch of dead stormtroopers inside their house off screen when Luke comes to find their corpses. Anyway, Owen puts up a decent fight but is outclassed, same with Baru, and man, Baru's hardcore, before Luke runs off into the desert, followed by Reaver, who's apparently still able to run after being impaled on a lightsaber and hit in her wound a couple of times. I mean, yeah, the Force, but also, how? And yeah, she chases him, and eventually she uses the force to make him fall and hit his head, knocking him out. And then she has the choice, finish him off or don't. But don't worry, because she has a crisis of faith immediately and decides not to become like Anakin, sparing him and carrying him back home. And luckily, Obi-Wan has just arrived, just in time to be relevant for the plot. Seriously, how did he arrive so quickly? Regardless, Owen and Baru take Luke inside, and Obi-Wan pats her on the back and sends her off to go find her own spin-off show. Apparently she's just going to be fine. She's not dying. We then have a bunch of scenes that kind of round out the show to set up for a new hope. First up, we have Vader on Mustafar getting both mocked and threatened by Palpatine about his obsession with Obi-Wan. And so, instead of being intensely angry in a new hope when they duel again, he's a bit more calm and collected, and therefore he gets the victory. 
We then have Leia embrace her role as both a future leader of Alderaan, and also foreshadows her key role in the Rebellion when she dresses up. And honestly, that whole scene with Obi-Wan and her at the end is just premium cheesy fan service, and I just loved it. Imagine how pissed she'd be in the future after hearing that she has these similarities to her biological father, only to discover that he was one of the worst people to ever live in recent memory. Whew. Also, this retroactively makes it very funny that she clearly knew Obi-Wan in a much, much more intimate way than Luke ever did, and yet after losing her parents, Planet, and then her heroic saviour, who she clearly came to love as an uncle-grandfather type thing, she is the one to give Luke all of the comfort after they escape the Death Star. <laughs> also, it now retroactively makes me angry that Obi-Wan only gives Luke Force visions and speaks to him exclusively during A New Hope and Beyond. It's not like she couldn't do it either. Luke was trained for all of five minutes before his first Force vision. Also, the will I ever see you again felt like it came straight out of the Phantom Menace when Anakin says goodbye to his mother. Back on Tatooine, Obi-Wan packs up his cave and moves on to find that house he lives in during A New Hope, and then goes off to see Luke, and gives him a hello there and the toy. And then he has a chat with Qui-Gon at long last, who he probably hasn't been able to contact due to his inner turmoil. He probably had to accept that what happened to Anakin wasn't his fault, and that he made his own choices when he turned to the dark side. And so, off they go into the wastes together to finish off both the episode and the series. And I loved this. I know the series wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but I'm a die-hard prequels Obi-Wan fanboy. And so, this was all I wanted and all I needed. Some parts were a bit iffy, I will admit. But overall, I think it adds a lot of depth in the relationships between a lot of the characters and adds to the emotional impact of a number of key deaths during the fourth film. But anyway... That's the end of the episode, and the end of the video, and the end of the series. And these were just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? What about the series in general? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know. 